We'd like to welcome you to this week's edition of the St. Mark Spark. It's good to be with you all here on this rather dreary uh, middle of the week, this hump day in the middle of Holy Week. Uh, this is an opportunity, though, to dive a little bit deeper into the gospel text we have from our On Your Mark series as we continue through the gospel of Mark. Uh, last week was the triumphal entry, but we focused on um, Palm Sunday. We focused on the anointing of Jesus by a woman in Bethany. This was a woman who uh, opens up a uh, bottle of perfume, a costly uh, perfume made from pure nard. We're talking lots and lots of money, very expensive. Uh, people around her are complaining about the waste. They're complaining about how the money could have been, could have been given to the poor, etc. And Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you. Now, when Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, this is not an excuse to say, well, just throw up our hands in the air and say we cannot do anything about it, or that Jesus somehow did not care for the poor, because the opposite is true. It, it really feels truly that Jesus had a preferential option for those who were poor, those who were outcasts, those who were uh, disregarded and uh, overlooked by the powers that be. It's over and over and over again, it is the the children or the, the women or the outsider, or the foreigner, that Jesus seems to be drawn to being into that relationship with uh, throughout his ministry. But more than that, friends, is, is the point when Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, which means there's always work to do. And we know from Matthew chapter 25 that we cannot just simply disregard this because when we're feeding somebody who's hungry, we're feeding Jesus or giving water to someone who's thirsty, we're doing that to Jesus. When we're uh, comforting people or visiting people in prison, when we're doing all these different things, we are doing this to Christ. So when Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, that's not for us to disregard. It's a fact, it's, it's a call for us to be involved with that. But in this particular moment, uh, this woman who comes in is really the only person other than Jesus who knows what is going on. And, and so she anoints him for his burial. She, he's covered with the scent of this expensive perfume because soon enough, that's what happened on the Wednesday of Holy Week. That's what happened today. What's going to happen afterwards, we know uh, tomorrow on Thursday is the Last Supper. Uh, we know it's when Jesus gives his final commandment. We know that Thursday bleeds into Friday, and Friday will come his arrest and his conviction, his crucifixion, and his death. So this woman gets it. And there's just a little bit more that we're going to read, because the final part of that passage is what we talked about on Sunday, where Jesus says, Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has been done will be told in remembrance of her. It is an important thing, women in the Gospels. Oftentimes, women are overlooked in other places in Scripture. It's certainly overlooked in the, the age that Jesus was in, and a lot of times in our own as well. And yet, the women were the ones who understood. The women were the ones who got it. The women were the ones who followed Jesus even to and through the end. And so, it's important to hear their stories. So, we're told to remember remember what this woman has done and the next passage we hear from mark chapter 14 it's just two verses uh, we start at mark 14 10 and then verse 11. right after that then judas iscariot who was one of the twelve went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them when they heard it they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money so he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we just have this story of this woman in this amazing sacrificial giving, what she is going to do for Jesus. And immediately, and Mark is very, very uh, much of all the four gospels, is very much the one that gives us short snippets. In many ways, things are feel too short and too cut off and there's that feeling of saying wait wait what just happened 
this woman gets it. Jesus commends her. And then the next thing we hear is that Judas, Judas is not going to give anything for Jesus. Instead, Jesus is going seeking to do something to Jesus, and that is to betray him. And not that we need to have overarching or, or an over uh, bigger sense of sympathy for Judas, but there is something to be said about Judas here and then also about all the other disciples because Judas agrees to betray Jesus and then we go right into Thursday. We go from Wednesday into Thursday it's the Last Supper with the disciples. Jesus is talking, saying, I know someone here is going to betray me. There is the institution of the Last Supper. And then there is where Judas has agreed to betray Jesus. Jesus also says it's not just this one person. He says, Peter is going to deny me. Peter is going to uh, deny me three times before the cock crows twice. There's the prayer that Jesus has in Gethsemane and takes a few disciples with them and all of them fall asleep three times. That magic number, that holy number three. Jesus goes back to the disciples and says, can you please stay up with me? I am grieving. I'm distressed. I'm agitated even to the point of death. Please remain here. Please keep awake. And they cannot. And then there is the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. There is then the arrest of Jesus, and the rest of the story plays out where Jesus is being tried. The rest of the story plays out where they are trying to trump up false allegations and charges against him. And while all this happens, Peter is close by, but at a distance, a little bit further now, and Peter denies Jesus, not once, not twice, not three times and the cock crows the rooster crows peter remembers in that moment what jesus had said chapter 14 has got a lot of stuff that's going on in it and yet in this story where we point to judas as the one who betrays it is peter who denies it is thomas who doubts it's the rest of the disciples who largely scatter. They are not staying in there. It is people like this woman. This woman at the beginning of our chapter today is this woman who is not named, but this woman who is remembered. As we go into Friday, it is the women who stay at the cross in Mark's Gospel. No mention of men is the women who stay there even to and through his last breath and his last cry. I think before we get too hard on the disciples, perhaps it's incumbent on us as we are at the midweek point of Holy Week, as we look in the Hosannas of Sunday, feel like a distant echo in the hope of resurrection sees, seems too far and distant over the horizon. So maybe check our spirits today and think about the many ways likely that we have already agreed to betray Jesus in our actions. The ways that we have denied him by denying care for those who are hungry and those who are thirsty, the way that we abandon Jesus by not loving our neighbors as ourselves. One of the first things we do at every worship service is the prayer of confession. And the prayer of confession, we do that so the idea is that we can let go of these things that we do sometimes every once in a while, and sometimes these are habitual sins, so we can let go of these, sin these sins, so we can hear the words of forgiveness, so we can get on with the worship service. And we should never take confession lightly. We should never take this promise of forgiveness lightly, because the fact of the matter is, is that whatever we don't do to the least of these, whatever we don't do to the poor, what we don't do to the overlooked, what we don't do to those who have no power or privilege, whether they be the outsider, whether they be 
uh, somebody of a discounted gender, whether they be somebody who is not old enough, uh, a child, whatever we're not doing to take care of them, we are not doing that to Christ. It's a hard week that is before us. Mark chapter 14 is hard reading. Mark 15 is even harder. But we have to go through this. We have to read this, take these stories to heart. If Easter is to mean anything other than just lilies at the front or familiar hymns being sung or or the nicest dresses and suits being worn, we have to take this week seriously. It is at last what we are told that I want, what Paul says, I want to know a death like Jesus. I want to know a death like Jesus because perhaps if I know a death like his, then I will know a resurrection like his. We have to know these hard things if we ever hope for something better. And it begins with with accepting the ways we deny the ways we abandon, and the ways that we betray. To ask God for forgiveness and to seek the new day. Seek the new day and to try to follow just a little bit closer. Tomorrow night, we are going to have our Monday, Thursday service at 7 o'clock. On Friday, we're going to have our journey to the cross from 11 to 7 with the Good Friday service occurring at 3. And then our Holy Saturday service, our Great Easter Vigil will be in the Fellowship Hall on Saturday at 5 o'clock. And the whole week concludes and the new day begins on Easter Sunday at 10 10 a.m. as we gather together in the hope of the resurrection. I pray that you are blessed. I pray that God is with you. And I pray that you pay attention. Pay attention to our actions, your actions, my actions, our actions. Pay attention to the needs of the world. And may you see the world with the eyes of our Savior, the Christ. May God be with you this day and always. Amen.